Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before we start, uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you've got your phones on you, if you could turn them to silent, please. But we, we do like you to tweet or whatever social media you prefer to talk about the event. Uh, emergency exits, there's one down here at the front and there's two at the back where you came in. And the toilets are back down towards the door and around on the right hand side. So in gathering here today, we acknowledge the Ghana people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our, pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and extend that respect to other Arab, Arab, Aboriginal people present. So welcome uh, to a stargazing, the second in our Sir Ross and Sir Keith Smith Fund Space in the Community Lecture Series. Tonight's event is kindly sponsored by the City of Salisbury, who are very grateful for their support. This event is part of the public outreach associated with the Southern Hemisphere Space Studies Programme, a five-week intensive multidisciplinary space studies programme conducted by the University of Australia in partnership with the International Space University. Uh, as you probably all know, that, that wasn't me, honest. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, the weather hasn't been kind to us today, and although it looks as though there's a break in the cloud now, we have to cancel the stargazing part of the evening. Uh, so thank you for coming out anyway, and for those of you who didn't find out until too late, I do apologize. Um, however, for our future young astronomers out there, uh, we will still be giving out some free telescopes at the end of the, the lecture for them to take home and experiment uh, with looking at the stars themselves. Uh, so, it's a great pleasure tonight to invite Paul. Paul's an old friend of mine. I think we met probably the first week I came to Australia, uh, and we meet up at these events every other week now. <laughs> uh, Paul Kerno is the Vice President of the Astronomical Society of South Australia, and a former council member of the Field Geology Club of South Australia. He's been a lecturer at the Adelaide Planetarium, which is here at UniSA, since 1992, and is a three-time winner of the Astronomical Society's uh, Astronomical Society of South Australia's Editor's Award in 2000, 2010, and 2013. He is regarded as one of the world's leading authorities on Australian Aboriginal night sky knowledge, and Paul appears regularly in the media and has authored over 50 articles on astronomy. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to invite Paul. Thank you. So you can hear me okay on the microphone? Good. Better All right. Than Sorry? Better than 80. Better than 80. <laughs> All right. So um, we can, uh, how do we get back to my presentation on this? Just keep going through. It's in there. Okay. All right. So tonight we're talking about the um, Aboriginal Australian view of the night sky. And um, so I'd like to also thank the Salisbury Council for sponsorship and the International Space University for inviting me to speak to you all tonight. Um, before we talk about the Indigenous view of the night sky, we also need to think about how astronomers use the constellations of the night sky today. And the constellations we use today, they particularly come from the ancient Sumerians who lived in the area that is modern-day Iraq. And that knowledge was passed on to groups like the Phoenicians, who were mariners, and they travelled about the Mediterranean. And that knowledge, in turn, was passed on to the Greeks and the Romans, and over time, uh, down to us. So we have a very Eurocentric view of the night sky. And the constellations were finalised by the International Astronomical Union in 1922 at a meeting in Rome. So basically it was a case of, look, there are so many different ways of looking at the sky, we have to sit down and w work out one way that the world will look at the night sky. Suffice it to say in 1922, um, we didn't have a situation where they invited Indigenous Australians, Native Americans, people from Africa and other parts of the world. And only recently the uh, International uh, Star Names Working Group started working on uh, correcting that by adding... Uh, Inuit names, Native American names, and there are four official Aboriginal Australian names now used for uh, particular stars. So, uh, as I was saying, 88 constellations in total, and a con the word constellation is Latin, 
and it means with stars, all right? So for the benefit of the kids, you guys have played dot to dot before, where you go from one to two, and you end up with the shape of a, a lion or something like that. Yeah. Um, what shape do you like? Anything in particular you've come up with? No, nothing in particular. And so people do that with the stars, or they've done that with the stars in the past, where they've uh, imagined lines. So constellations are not of nature. They come from the human imagination. All right. Now, we have to think about how many um, groups there are in Australia. When I first started doing astronomy and I started becoming indig uh, interested in the indigenous night sky, I remember meeting a gentleman and he said, I'll be able to show you uh, an Aboriginal, some Aboriginal constellation. And he showed me a certain part of the sky and I said, uh, what group does that belong to? And he said, it's an Aboriginal constellation. I said, yeah, but for which group, which mob? And he looked at me like I was sort of strange. Uh, and it occurred to me that he hadn't realised that uh, there are lots of different groups in Australia. And this map, <coughs> excuse me, was designed by an anthropologist named Norman Tyndale, who was born in Perth in 1900. He came to Adelaide at the age of 17 and ended up working for the South Australian Museum for 49 years, most of his life, and passed away in his 90s in California in about uh, 1993, I think it was. But what he did in the 1920s and 30s was work with a lot of Aboriginal communities, and in 1974, he basically published this map. So these boundaries aren't set in stone, but they give us a rough idea of the different groups in Australia and the diversity. So what we have here is a language map. And I guess the point, and that's Norman Tyndale sitting there as well. So I guess the point I'm making here is that um, we can't think of one group or one way of seeing the night sky. There can be like hundreds of different ways to see, say, the Southern Cross, for example, or the region of Orion, all right? There's no one way. Although certainly there are connections between groups. Does that make sense? Please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions if you have questions. You'll interrupt me and ask questions? If you, you need to ask? Maybe. Okay. Um, so, all right. So we have this diverse way. What do you do if you have cultures that don't use or didn't in the past use a written language um, and how do you pass on knowledge? You know, so there are various ways you can pass on knowledge. And if you were to talk, um, I've given a talk on Māori astronomy on the, uh, New Zealand and one of the ways they would communicate would be, for example, tattoos, the moko. So the Māori elders told me that if in the old days, if they walked into a village, they would know all about that person just by the style of tattoo uh, they had on their uh, face. So basically, there are a number of ways knowledge has been passed on here in Australia. One of them is through art. Art is a very good way to uh, pass on knowledge. And there are various mediums uh, throughout Australia. There are petroglyphs. So petroglyphs are carvings in the rock. There are pictographs where we see ochre paintings on rocks uh, and so forth. And I'll give you a few examples here. The Tiwi Islands, which are about 80 kilometres or so uh, off the coast of the Northern Territory. And here's an example of one painted in 1954. Um, and it shows uh, some stars. It shows women as stars. It shows the moon. It shows some clouds and so on. One of the problems with um, Aboriginal um, art and looking at the stars is they're a little bit like the ancient Egyptians. The ancient Egyptians did the same thing. The ancient Egyptians tended to go for artistic arrangement rather than accurate arrangement. So you can look at an ancient Egyptian constellation and say, well, that doesn't quite match up with the stars. Um, and they're very much the same with indigenous cultures within Australia as well. And I'm not sure if I mentioned, but there, there are about 300 distinct Aboriginal languages and with dialectual diversity, uh, that expanded to about 600 different languages. Here's another example uh, from the Northern Territory and the Tiwi Island region. Uh, now, this represents the sun or the eye of the sun woman. And around the edge, we have stars, all right? And these are the sun's rays coming down here, all right? So uh, hopefully you're sort of getting the point about artistic arrangement rather than uh, what we'd call accurate arrangement. Um, and Wadapunili is the sun woman. In, in fact, her uh, brother, uh, uh, Kupali, uh, he was rubbing some sticks together and he noticed they generated heat. So he passed one to a friend of his, uh, Japara, 
and Japara became the moon man, and so the moon is seen as a man carrying a torch across the sky, and Wadupanili is the sun woman. So when she sets, they'd say the guy would come across with his torch uh, after that. All right? Uh, another example, if you get time to pop into the uh, Art Gallery of South Australia, uh, you'll see uh, this uh, up here represents the belt stars in the constellation of Orion. <coughs> These three stars are what we often, well, when I was a kid, we'd associate with the saucepan. And the saucepan is a nickname for part of the constellation of Orion. But in the circle here, we see the Pleiades, which is a cluster of stars. Uh, these stars are located about 378 uh, light years away. Um, and uh, the, again, they've gone in for artistic arrangement rather than uh, accurate arrangement when they draw these um, as well. Hello, Paolo. Come va, mi Camille? Benny, yeah, good. Good to see you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so a couple of ex some examples for uh, art as well. Let's uh, have a look at the Yadwajali people who come from uh, Victoria, particularly close to the word Gaia language. Now, in South Australia, there are about 54 different language groups, about 34 in um, Victoria. And again, these aren't set in stone. Um, these boundaries are sort of uh, changing over time with native title and so on. The reason I've got this particular character here, this is a character called uh, Bunjil, and this is the only artwork depicting Bunjil. He is considered to be one of the creator beings of groups from this area. Um, and unfortunately, you know, they have to fence these areas in now, protect them from graffiti artists and vandals and so on. But it's very rare. And he's usually depicted um, or represented in the sky by the star Altair. And Altair is a star that sits about 17 light years away. It's in the constellation of uh, Aquila the Eagle. There we go, a little bit of scientific. I've got a little bit of scientific data in there so the people that are more technically minded don't doze off. We're all right, so I forgot to say no snoring, um, at least not in the first part. And so that's, uh, this is actually in the Black Range, I should say, near the Grampians, but you can see they've kind of got this area fenced in because one of the problems we've had in Australia with some of these remote areas uh, you've got guys coming in with chisels and chiseling out things and stealing things, which is uh, a great shame. In fact, one of the ones I'll show you in uh, near Nort Nort, they did a bit of damage to that area. Um, so bordering groups sometimes use different stars for um, uh, the same creator being. He's uh, represented, his totemic animal is uh, Bunjil, is the eagle, the wedge-tailed eagle, which is the largest bird of prey uh, in Australia, Aquila audax. Uh, the Wachulbalik people from in this area here, again, you can see they use the star called Fomalhuk. Um, so there are little differences. And the Kulin believe the star Altair also represents... The Kulin people come from uh, the Melbourne region. I think we've got a few students from Melbourne here as well, haven't we, in the ISU this year. Um, so from around that area there. Uh, if you're wondering about these numbers, these are just the spectral classes of the star. They tell you a little bit about how hot the star is and its mass, how big it is, and so on. All right? Does that make sense? Yeah? Maybe. Maybe? Yeah. You, you just interrupt me and ask if it doesn't. Um, and uh, here is uh, one of the uh, Nungaraku custodians. I think this is Ivy from memory. Um, with a sun petroglyph at Nort Nort. And you can see that petroglyph there. Uh, and this marks the women's camp because the women often identified with the sun and the moon often identified with the men. And so if we talk about the Ghana people, the Ghana call the sun Tindo uh, and they call the moon Kakara. And Tindo is a female and Kakara is represented as a male in the sky. Uh, when I mention about people chipping things out, this is the oldest archaeological, well, first archaeological site in Australia. I think it was 1927 or around that era they investigated. They found it had been occupied for about 8,000 years. It's located between Nildotti and Manham in South Australia. They do have tours there if you want to go for tours uh, with the uh, Nungaraku people. But, you know, they've had to try and protect the site because they've had um, people coming in and chipping out petroglyphs. And, in fact, one of them uh, was of a, a, a tortoise, a turtle, um, and they broke it. It ended up breaking on the, the ground, which was a, you know, tragedy. One of them they found at the airport in Japan just before it was going to a, a dealer. Uh, so 
You know, this has been a constant problem, not just in Australia, in, in North America and places like that, with Native American sites uh, and so on, have had that, uh, that problem. All right, and I mentioned the, the men identified with the moon, the moon camp. Uh, this is a lunar petroglyph uh, here. All right, that's the crescent moon. I think I've got a close-up of this. Uh, the crescent moon. Here we go. Um, crescent moon there. All right, with a spear through it there, just marking the men's camp. All right. These dots represent full moon, so they were keeping records of the full moon uh, as well. All right, I think my point is going a bit flat. The... Uh, the other way that knowledge could be... I've got batteries, don't worry. Um, the, uh, the other way that um, uh, you can pass on knowledge, of course, is through dance. And there are quite a few uh, Aboriginal dancers that talk about, particularly the Seven Sisters, uh, which is a cluster of stars in Taurus. And here we have a group of women uh, doing the Seven Sisters dance, a dance, uh, the Narundari, relating to Narundari, who was a creative being of the Nurunjeri people from the uh, Kurong region of South Australia. That's, uh, that's um, uh, Moogie, for those people that might know Moogie. Um, <clears throat> but the main way, of course, is through oral narration, through storytelling. And Aboriginal people are great storytellers. Uh, and, you know, you've got this great cosmic storyboard in the sky. You only have to look up. Astronomy is very, very cheap. Um, you don't have to uh, buy telescopes and binoculars and stuff like that. You can go just out in the backyard and look with mum. Can't you? Sounds like, does mum take you out the backyard? <laughs> You're putting her on the spot now, sometimes. You've got to say, mum, let's go out and look at the stars now, don't you? All right, so, so storytelling as well is a good way to pass on knowledge. Now, David Uniapon, who is a gentleman uh, that we see on the $50 note, uh, he, as you can see here, said the Aborigines have a myth uh, connected with nearly all the constellations and the bright stars in the heavens. I'm going to change batteries while I'm talking. The, um, and so uh, David Uniapon, he um, travelled about Australia and actually collected a lot of stories from various groups and published them in a book. I can't remember the name of the book offhand, but he was a great inventor as well uh, and um, features uh, very prominently in Australian history. Uh, so he's someone that we sort of all should know about. And I know as a teacher, sometimes I look at uh, Australian money and I think, oh, who's that person again? And I often when I'm talking to people from overseas, I ask them the same question. Who's that person on the note? And most people don't know. Um, although there are exceptions. I think in the US, the, the presidents, they know them straight away. So uh, we need to know who some of these guys are as, uh, as well. That's a little better, I think. The, um, now, we live on the Adelaide Plains, the traditional homelands of the Ghana people. And um, <clears throat> how do we know about the Ghana night sky? We primarily know about the Ghana night sky because two Lutheran missionaries that came to the colony in 1838, um, and Adelaide was settled by Europeans in 1836. You knew that, didn't you, guys? Yeah, that's why the, we have a 36ers basketball team. That's why they're called the 36ers. All right, so some good trivia for quiz night. So uh, Adelaide was settled by Europeans. Of course, the Ghana were here for thousands of years before that, um, but we know a bit about the way they saw the night sky uh, because the missionaries uh, wanted to convert the locals to Christianity and as a consequence of that they had to learn the language and they recorded some of their night sky knowledge as well. The Adyamatna come from the Flinders Ranges in there and I will mention the Nurunjeri people who come from in that region uh, there as well. <coughs> so in the Ghana dreaming, and the dreaming is kind of a almost like a belief system, if you like. It's a Western term, uh, but it has a set of rules uh, that people have to live by and laws and so on. But the first character to uh, travel up to the sky was a guy called Monona, and he basically threw a spear up into the heavens and it stuck to the sky. So in, with lots of groups, they saw the sky world as a place that clever medicine men could travel into very easily, and sometimes that wasn't very high. You know, it was like if I'd climb up the stairs and sort of reach the ceiling, it might be at that distance. So it was pretty close. And so he threw a spear up. <clears throat> then he threw another spear, and that stuck to the end of that spear. And he kept on doing that until there were spears all the way down to the ground. Um, and he climbed up into the sky. The Milky Way is called Wadley Purry. And Wadley means a hut. It's the same as Worley, if you're familiar with the term Worley. And Purry means river. 
and you'll see the name Puri in lots of names around Adelaide, like Onka Paringa. It comes from Yankee, the women's camp, Puri River, and Inga is a, a location. It, it tells you it's at that place. All right? The, um, so uh, that's quite a common name. Now, so what we're seeing here is the band of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, and you're seeing the accumulated light from millions and millions of stars, but our eyes aren't quite sensitive enough to be able to define them into individual stars. Yes? I don't think he can reach that many feet to climb into the sky. You don't think he could climb into the sky? Yeah. Why? Oh, not enough spears. Yeah. All right. So what's your name again, sweetheart? Maria. Maria. Yeah, Maria was saying uh, there's not enough spears to climb into the sky. Good point. Good point, Maria. We need more spears in there. All right. So you're seeing the accumulated light from about 200 billion stars in our galaxy. So we're not looking at objects outside of our galaxy. And um, if we talk about, uh, you know, stars in the universe, the latest, according to latest estimates... There's something like 70 sextillion stars in the universe. That's a, a seven, uh, that's basically 70,000 million, 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 or a seven followed by 22 zeros. Is that right, Mike? <laughs> That'd be right. Um, so there's a lot of stars. And so we're just seeing stars that are in our galaxy, which is one galaxy, the uh, Milky Way. Also, the dark areas in the galaxy uh, we've got the best skies in the southern hemisphere because the tilt of the Earth is angled towards the centre of our galaxy. And the dark area is the garner called Yurikawi. And this is monster water. This was an area where a monster lived. So they used to teach kids, don't go near the edge of the water. And this applied to the Celestial River as well. This is the Southern Cross. And uh, the Southern Cross is the smallest constellation of the 88. Uh, and the Southern Cross shape is that shape there. All right? You can see different coloured stars. Different coloured stars. Why do you think there are different coloured stars, mate? Why do you think the stars are different colours? Not sure? Have a guess. Is it because of the colours from um, further away? Some of them could be further away. Did you want to have a guess? Ooh, bucket of paint on them. Could be that. You're ducking your head like, don't pick me, don't pick me. What do you think? Um, no idea. So when we look at stars, oh yes, over there. Did you want to have a guess? Oh, she's coming down the front. Why do you think they're different colours? Did Dad tell you that? Well, you knew that. Dad told you that. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Um, it is because they're burning at different temperatures. So, you know, you can look at a star that appears quite close, but it could be a long way away because it's burning at a high temperature. So when we look at stars, the blue stars are burning at really high temperatures um, and the red stars are burning at lower temperatures. All right? So the red stars, on average, tend to live a little bit longer. Now, uh, Wilto is the Ghana name for the Southern Cross. And as you can see, this is the Eagle's Claw. All right? And that artwork's been done by the renowned local artist, Gail Glasper. Um, and so this is the Eagle's Claw. And basically the view uh, is, and you can see the uh, Adyamatna people call it Wildu Mandawi. So Wildu is the same name for that uh, eagle. And basically when someone passes away, I'm going to use you as an example, David, the Eagle's Claw would come out of the sky and grab that person's spirit and carry you up to what they call uh, the Vukana Awi. It would carry your spirit up to the sky and take you through the Milky Way and wash the ochres and pollutants that you'd accumulated on your body uh, while you lived on the earth. And as you can see, the name for um, uh, the spirit is Wanapi uh, in their uh, culture. <clears throat> the um, the Naranjeri people, though, they see it differently again. They see it as a stingray. They don't see it as uh, the eagle's claw. So as soon as we go over the Adelaide Hills, so the Adelaide Hills is the Paramount people, and we head to the southeast, we're in the lands of the Nutanjeti people. And as you can see, this is uh, Nunganadi, the stingray. And I actually think this makes a better stingray than it does a cross. Okay? What do you think, mate? Do you think so? 
Yeah, it makes a better stingray. So all of you guys are going to be astronomy teachers, and what I mean by that uh, is at some stage you're going to be at a barbecue or at a friend's place, and Vi, is it V? Yes, uh, you're going to say, hey, did you know that some groups uh, see this as a stingray? All right, you may not remember it's another jetty people. And the two pointer stars here, which we call, we call the pointers, Alpha and Beta Centauri, um, they point towards the Southern Cross roughly there, and they're called the Narakani, and they are two sharks that are chasing the stingray across the sky. All right? Now, that star there, I don't know if there are many people old enough. Oh, there's a few. Um, when I was a little kid, I used to rush home from school to watch a television show called Lost in Space. Anyone remember that? You remember that? And that, that star, Alpha Centauri, is the close, closest neighbouring star system after the sun. That's why the Robins, uh, Robinsons were heading there. And uh, technically, this star is actually three stars. Uh, there are two main components that take uh, 80 years to orbit each other. And then there's a third component that takes about three quarters of a million years to orbit them, uh, called Proxima Centauri. And that's a tenth of a light year closer. Now, this star is 4.3 light years away. What I mean by that is uh, if you could travel at the speed of light, which is incredibly fast, it would still take you four years and four months uh, for light to leave that star and or reach that star. Uh, so the speed of light is approximately 300,000 kilometres per second. Uh, for the Puritans of the audience, it's 299,792.458. But much easier to remember, about 300,000. So, you know, and we're just talking about the distance to the nearest star, all right? We're not talking about stars. And, you know, our galaxy is about 100,000 uh, light years across. I just thought I'd put this in. Um, with the courses, we, like I work for the planetarium and we run courses there, and we focus a lot on star names. And so, as I kind of said, um, some of these stars weren't given official names until just recently. Uh, in fact, some in uh, the last uh, couple of years. And... Stars are named in two ways. They have an individual name, but not always an individual name, and they always have a scientific name. And a German lawyer by the name of Johann Bayer, he decided to give the brightest stars a letter of the Greek alphabet. So the brightest stars were alpha, the next brightest stars were beta, and so on. That's the one way. But the individual names we can see here, and these ones obviously from Latin like Acrux, Mimosa, and Gay Crux. So, um, Oh, excuse me. The, um, the Southern Cross, the, the name for the constellation is Latin, Crux. Um, but these ones have been added uh, later. This is an African name from, I believe it's the Mercy people from Ethiopia. And this is one of the official Australian Aboriginal names uh, that's been added. There are four. Uh, Ginan comes from the Waterman people from the Northern Territory. Uh, in particular, the guy is Bill Harney, who I've had here in Adelaide, wonderful man. It's in his late 80s now, but I'd like to kidnap him for a week. He's just incredible. You can sit there with him and he'll go through the whole sky and talk about the way the sky is seen by uh, his people. So Ginan is uh, the, one of the official names, and that's referring to uh, Epsilon um, Crucius there. You know when you have a bit of a rain like we had the other night's hot weather and you've got a fork in the tree and you get a little bit of water gathering in the fork... Uh, and the bugs come in to uh, eat, uh, sorry, to drink, um, and then the um, uh, little birds come in and they eat the bugs. Uh, well, the Borong uh, people from northwestern Victoria, they call this uh, Torchin Bongara, and this is a constellation called Coma Berenices, which is sort of uh, lots of clusters of stars. Some of these constellations you need to see under really dark skies, and we are so lucky uh, that we live in a country where the skies are still pretty dark. Uh, I've been uh, overseas to uh, some northern hemisphere countries and the skies are not good. Population, large cities, lots of street lighting, um, you know, uh, and it's just a glow. And my colleague up the back there, Martin Lewecki, put your hand up, Martin. Martin's the light pollution officer for the Astronomical Society and he um, often speaks to councils uh, about uh, putting in energy efficient lighting, lighting that's aiming down at the ground, so that we don't lose our night skies. And it's a bit of an irony that that light has been travelling for thousands of years and it's lost in the last fraction of a second of the pollution we create. So we talk about protecting the environment as far as the trees and so on, 
we also need to protect our uh, night skies. And that is happening in South Australia in a place called Mildandra uh, at the moment as well. We've got a dark sky park, which is really great. Another view of the Southern Cross comes from the uh, Karajeri people uh, from Western Australia. They're up near the uh, Broome area. <clears throat> and they believe that uh, there were two hunters, Kunbi and Jitabiti, and they lived in the sky world. And uh, there wasn't a lot of food in the sky world. So they wanted to go down and get some food from the earth, so they came down from the sky. Where do you go when you get hungry? The fridge? McDonald's? Yep. So these guys had to come down from the sky. They had a long journey. Yep. The, um, so they had to come down from the sky world, and they brought their fire sticks. And their fire sticks were said to have been um, infused, if you like, with magic as well. And so these guys went hunting, and the fire sticks were dancing around, and they set fire to the bush. Um, and so they had to rush back, grab their fire sticks and travel back up into the Milky Way. And there are the two men, those two stars and the Southern Cross. I beg your pardon, the other way around. The two men uh, just there and the two stars there represent uh, the fire sticks um, in the sky. Um, Karambo is a, a guy that comes from, I think it's New South Wales. Uh, he was um, chasing a, a person, let's say, uh, who didn't want to be chased. And so that person's husband came along and said, you're in trouble, mate. So he ran up a tree and he climbed up into the sky and then the guy set fire to the tree and he kept climbing up and he became the star all Debron. All right? There's one of the names for the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters uh, cluster as well. All Debron is quite a bright star. It's orange giant, uh, spectral class K5, about 68 light years away in the constellation of Taurus. It marks one of the eyes of the bull. All right, and I, I'm not sure if I mentioned already, but the majority, a uh, uh, large percentage of star names are Arabic in origin. They were very good stellar cartographers, and they made uh, ma good maps, and they named stars uh, individually. Uh, this guy was a, uh, an eagle. His name was Malyangar, and this is just to make reference to planets. He's represented in the sky as the planet Venus, and you'll know Venus is the second planet from the sun, it's about 108 million kilometres from the sun. It takes about 225 days to orbit the sun just once. There's a Magellan space probe image of um, Venus. Anyway, this guy would come down and he was hunting humans, so he's considered a bit of a cannibal um, and not very popular with his uh, group. So they actually set his tree on fire and got uh, rid of him. So, you know, it's uh, very common to see if you're from the desert, you've got eagles and birds and reptiles in the sky. If you come from the coast, you've got um, uh, marine life like uh, stingrays and sharks. Um, so whatever's on the land is often reflected in the sky um, <clears throat> as well. Um, this is uh, another example. This is uh, Yarundu. And Yarundu uh, is when death came into the world. And the mob from this area believe that uh, when humans were first formed by a creator being called Bayami, that... Um, uh, they were given a number of laws. One of them that was they weren't allowed to kill a kangaroo. Um, they broke that law and one of the guys, or two men and a woman, said, I'm not having anything to do with this. And so uh, he walked across a Coolabar plain and left the site and uh, he collapsed under this large white yarn, which is a tree. Two soft sulphur-crested cockatoos called the Muyi. Uh, they chased him as well. Um, and... He collapsed because he was weak, and what happened was there was a loud clap of thunder and two fiery eyes appeared next to the tree, and um, they elevated the man up into the sky and placed him in a hollow inside the tree. Then the tree ripped itself up and ascended up into the sky and eventually faded from view, and the two sulphur-crested cockatoos are these two stars here, the pointers, uh, the spirit of death. When death came into the world, those two stars there and the, the eyes of the first man to die on the earth as well. So, um, you know, I hope you can appreciate how different um, these stories can be. Here we see uh, Orion, and uh, Orion, you can see for my American friends, it's the right way up here, down under. It's, this is what we call the right way up. Uh, but Orion is, um, the shoulders are here, all right? The uh, head, well, we're just clever, we stand on our heads. Um, and the belt stars are here, and the two legs just there, and the sword hanging down from the belt uh, just there. And uh, in Australia, when I was a little boy,
We'd call this the saucepan, which is an asterism. So it's a nickname for part of a constellation. The saucepan shape there, bottom, side, handle there. Uh, but uh, Bill Harney, the waterman elder, calls it Jigadaja, and it's seen as a willy wagtail, right? And you can see the eye there and the belly there and the tail up like that. There's a willy wagtail. And once you've had it pointed out as the willy wagtail, you always see the willy wagtail uh, in there as well. Uh, the Adyamatna see these stars, they're called the Miracha, again a group of hunters that are returning from a, a hunting mission, uh, somewhat similar to the um, Ghana view. Uh, Dininyarana was the Ghana view, again these stars are returning from the hunt and they are going to join the stars, the Pleiades, uh, which are located in the constellation Taurus. Uh, the Pleiades are roughly, depending on the source you look at, 378 light years away. Uh, we think they're probably about 50 million years old. So they're very, very um, uh, old. Um, who can tell me, who out of the kids here, when, when roughly did the dinosaurs die out? Long while ago. So the dinosaurs, most of the dinosaurs became extinct about 66 million years ago. So these stars being about 50 million years old, uh, if you were to look into the night sky, you wouldn't see these stars. They didn't exist if you were a dinosaur. Um, this star here is the star called Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse has been doing all kinds of funny things lately. It's dimming and it's brightening and it's dimming and it's brightening. Uh, and Betelgeuse is a star that is a supernova candidate. So this star at some stage will go supernova in the near future. All right? And when I say the near future, I mean sometime within the next million years or so. All right, but it's about 640 or so light years away. If it went supernova 600 years ago, you'll see the flash in about 40 years. All right, so it takes time for light to travel from the star and reach us because light has a, a finite speed. Um, so yeah, keep an eye on this star. Keep an eye on this star. Um, when we had a supernova in the year 1054. Uh, that supernova could be seen in the day for three weeks. Uh, we know this because it was recorded by Chinese, Korean and Japanese astronomers, also recorded in Constantinople, um, and it was visible for 21 months in the night sky. So for those who don't know, basically a supernova is a large star. Uh, this was a type 2 supernova, so the outer, it used up its fuel, the outer layers collapse and they rebound off the iron core, and they completely destroy the star usually, leaving something like maybe a neutron star or so on. Uh, uh, this one here from Groot Island, this is a canoe, all right? So the point of the canoe there, shaped like that, another point there, all right? And there are three men sitting in the canoe. All right? <coughs> Coming back to the Seven Sisters, the, um, one of the names from the Bangala, Balari, uh, the Bangala people come from the Port Augusta area, in that region there, Wyala, Mukanyangaru from the Wachulbalak in Victoria, and Mankamankarana from the Ghana people. Mankara is the word for young female, all young women. Um, and so it's interesting to note that so many Australian Aboriginal cultures see these as a group of women, much like the European stories and much like other groups all over the world. Not all, some see them as, as men, uh, some see them uh, in parts of Southern Arabia, they call them Turanya, and they're seen as a herd of camels, right? So it does vary from culture to culture. Now, this is the first time I've ever shown this picture, which I took last year to an audience. Uh, this is relating to the Yugarilia, and Yugarilia is another name for the uh, Seven Sisters. It comes from the um, Wurangu people from um, the um, Great Australian Bight area. Uh, and they have a... Most Australian Aboriginal groups have a, uh, stories where the seven sisters are running away from the unwanted advances of a male, right? Sometimes that male is the moon, sometimes it's the sun, could be anything. So if you have a boy that likes you and you don't like him and you're running off, he's chasing you. Does that make sense? Yeah, a bit like dad did to mum or something like that. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so the guy that did this, and I'm just trying to think of his name, his name... Um, Jilby, the, the old man, this is his body laying uh, here. This is outside of uh, Port Lincoln. So that's his nose there. 
That's his eyes there, his chest there, and um, his, uh, where his hips are down here and his legs come down like that. All right? Now, I'm going to show you a short bit of video uh, with Vita Betts. Now, Vita Betts, is it on this slide or back a slide? Back a slide. All right, so where are we? Top right-hand corner. Oh, yeah, I see it. Yep. Um, and so this is uh, Vita Betts. And Vita Betts is um, that one there? Yep. Oh, yeah. Vita Betts is the grandmother of Eddie Betts, the footballer. You might know Eddie Betts. Uh, and so she's a Wurundjeri elder. And here she's talking about um, the story relating to this, this guy, this hill. Sound will be up. And he, he takes these young women up from the, right from the outback. The little serpent, the, the, the snake, the serpent. And as the serpent, the serpent went through, he was the serpent coming this way. He came through uh, Canella Caves. He made all them big holes, this big serpent, coming through Canella Caves and, and right through all the... Even out, the, out back, when there's a big storm and rain, he came through this big serpent. Anyway, the old man came as far as Longbury, and he saw this beautiful, beautiful girl, you know, and the girls, he chased the girls, up. and he sang out to them. The girls were too, too, too young, and, and they were right, right ahead of him. They couldn't, uh, he couldn't keep up with them with them, you know, so, um, so he sat down and he sang out to the girls, to the, to the, to the winners, to the girls, women. And they said, no, you're too old, you're too old. I was telling him, you know, but he sat down and he lied down. That means I'm in love with you. My heart loves you. My heart is good for you. But these women, they said, no way. There were seven of them. No way. That means you're too old. You're too old. So they cut it and they went. They got as far as the Blue Mountains. She's laughing. <laughs> Talking. She got, they got as far as the Blue Mountains. I think one sister fell down there. And that's her, the Blue Mountains. Then they went. They were taken away. They just went straight up. And they stay there for, 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 for all this time now, the seventh system. So what she's talking about here is, you might think the Blue Mountains are a long way away, um, but there are song lines that go throughout Australia where groups are connected to each other and they might sing a song and tell a story and get to one group here and that group will pick it up from that point and go on with that as well. And, as she, and those, those dreaming trails... Uh, and song lines go right throughout Australia. So there's the old fella. He's uh, what they call Ungul. He's sleeping uh, in that area uh, there. All right. In the Flinders Ranges, uh, it's very common to have stories of the Akuru, which are the, the dreaming serpents. Not to be confused with rainbow serpents. They come from more in the Northern Territory in Queensland. Um, but again, a group of women being uh, chased called the Atunyi, and they uh, want to hide from this guy... So they run into a big cave and what they realise or don't realise until a little bit later is they've run into the mouth of one of these big snakes, all right, and they're trapped. Cutting a long story short, after this there's a, a flood and the flood is so bad that the serpent drowns and you know when a, a, a body decays, it bloats up, the gas is built up and the serpent was said to float to the very top of the water and the, the belly burst open and the belly flung the women up into the sky. And that's how they explain the women came to being in the sky. I'm just realising I'm running a bit late here, so I might zip through some of these a little bit quicker. This is the constellation Gemini, 
Pollux and Cast of the two bright stars, called the Waki Kuchira by the uh, Narajara people from Western Australia. Uh, again, these are two hunters. Uh, they were the protectors of these uh, women, uh, which they called the Kunkurunkara. And again, they are referring to the Seven Sisters or the Pleiades Cluster, which is, again, a very common theme uh, found throughout Australia. If you're wondering about Gemini, uh, the bodies come along like this, down to the feet down there, and another one down uh, to here. Uh, again, you'll see the colour difference. Pollux in classical mythology was a pugilist, a boxer, and Castor was a renowned uh, horsebreaker. We have two satellite galaxies that go around our galaxy that are visible with the unaided human eye. Um, and if we're under dark skies, we can pick them up. And there they are there. That's known as the large and the small Magellanic Cloud. There's a name. When I was with the students today, I was trying to think. Brog, I was thinking, Pelican? No, it's not a Pelican. No, it's not this. Brogas was what I was trying to think of. Um, and so these two birds were chased by a group of emus. So they fled up into the sky and they flew around in the sky. And so they stay in the sky now um, to keep away from the, um, the emus. But this is a story from the Naranjeri uh, people. And so what we're seeing again here is the accumulated light from millions and millions of stars, but our eyes aren't quite, quite sensitive enough to be able to define them into individual stars. But we still see that accumulated glow. And the large Magellanic Cloud is about 170,000 light years away. All right, so again, if we could travel that, at that speed, it would take us that long. And in 1987, we had a supernova in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which was a really big deal uh, in the scientific community. Uh, I'm giving a talk on the 6th of February in Adelaide, if you're interested, on uh, meteorites. And so, uh, you know, how are meteors and comets seen? Kulda is the name for the uh, Naranjeri people. Yali Nilong from the Jaja Wurrung from Victoria. So some groups, many groups, see uh, falling stars or meteors when they fall in as a medicine man coming across. And sometimes, you know, when people would wake up with that fright, you do the, you know, because people were sleeping outside in those days, this was a medicine man tapping you with his spear as, as he went across. Uh, the, um, the Ghana see, when they see a, a falling star, they s uh, refer to that as an orphaned uh, child. Uh, as you can see, uh, Pur uh, Kurunuk from the Gunditjmara people of Victoria, generally uh, comets and unusual phenomena like um, um, auroras and so on were seen as portents of doom. Uh, so they weren't a good sign. So a lot of people tended to hide from these uh, kinds of events. And we were talking earlier that this was not uncommon in, uh, with many early cultures in Europe as well. Because we have such good dark skies in Australia, uh, many groups look at dark patterns as well. Now, uh, the Southern Cross is just in there. There's the two pointer stars. And this is a very common one in Australia called the emu. And that's his head there. That's the long neck and the body there. This was taken by a friend of mine when we were in Lake Tyrrell in Victoria. And the legs come down there. And so there are very practical reasons to monitor the sky. You needed in those days to know when the emu eggs were hatching as a source of food. You needed to know what plants were growing and so on. And the way to be able to do that was to monitor the night sky. So when the, um, the emu was first rising, this was a time when the, the emus were uh, reaching their mating cycle. So the, the female emu was said to be in a running position. When they got higher, they had laid the eggs. And the males, of course, sit on the eggs and look after the young and so on, depending on the position. Uh, Alakicha is another one that comes from the Arnhem Land area where the dark pattern known as the coal sack nebula this is a dark cloud of dust in space around 600 light years away, we believe, that is obscuring the stars in the background. There are still stars uh, in this area, so seen as a giant fish. At the end of the day, people sometimes say to me, well, is this science? You know, were they making scientific uh, observations? I think there's good reason to say yes. Um, <coughs> certainly a lot of them were, were uh, religious and spiritual ceremony type things. But this is a stone arrangement um, in uh, Wurdi Yuang in Victoria outside of Geelong. And what we've got here is when we stand here, there is an arrangement of rocks that go like that, goes like that. And these mark the setting position of the sun during the shortest day of the year, 
when we're roughly in between the equinoxes and the setting position of the sun uh, during the longest day of the year. To me, you know, this is a, a scientific observation. And we believe these um, uh, stones are older than Stonehenge. So, you know, they've been making these observations for some time. The uh, Nort Nort, the Nungaraku people, as I mentioned earlier, these dots, they tell me, are full moons. And what they're basically using was like a lunar calendar to say, we're going to have a party in five full moons. I'm making five full moons. All right, something like that. Um, and so they were keeping... Uh, the, the Paramount people, when the settlers came here and they were work, working in the Adelaide Hills, when they had tools and shovels, they were notching on the, the wooden tools and they didn't know what they were doing. But they were recording full moons and they, that's how they used to record the age of their children and to know when to uh, hold certain events and so on. Thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you very much, Paul. And if you'd join me again in thanking Paul for what was an illuminating and interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I'm going to advertise for Paul a little bit. He's got a couple more events coming up for those that are interested. On the Thursday, the 6th of February, the talk he mentioned about meteorites. And also later on, on the 29th, uh, a talk about the night skies of the Karaburi people. Um, I need to thank the program sponsors again, especially the City of Salisbury for supporting this event tonight. And on the screen there we have our, our other program sponsors, some program sponsors, scholarship providers, sponsored placements, and the event sponsors. Uh, and without our sponsors we wouldn't be able to run our, our Southern Hemisphere Space Studies program, and, and we wouldn't be able to do these public events. Uh, and I'd like to thank you all again for coming out, despite the stargazing being cancelled, and I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Um, if you want to tweet and look at social media, um, uh, we'll be advertising some of our future events. We have an event on Wednesday night in the city uh, uh, from, from Alan Duffy, Professor Alan Duffy from Swinburne, on dark matter, and, which will be very interesting. What time does that start? Six. 6 p.m. Thank you. Um, ah, we don't need to see where the <laughs> snark hazing is going to be. Um, and as you leave, uh, our, our young astronomers can collect their free telescopes in the foyer. So thank you very much again for coming. Thank you. I should have asked that, Reddy. Are there any other questions for Paul? We, Paul asked lots of questions of the children, and I didn't ask anyone else. Yeah, a question? Put your hand up. Ah, we have one over here. Um, I was just wondering, what did the Aboriginal people call the Southern Celestial Pole? Uh, I'm not aware of any name for the South Celestial Pole. Um, they certainly would have noticed the stars rotated around that point. Uh, but they tended to uh, monitor the movement of constellations as a bit of a timekeeping piece particularly throughout the year, to, again, to know what sort of foods were available and, and so on. But I'm not aware of any name they gave to the South Celestial Pole. They may have. Um, Bill Harney, he calls the Milky Way Bonin, which means spinning. Mm. Oh, hello. How many stars are they? are there in space and how do they count them? That many. There's <laughs> lots. Um, it's a bit, not an easy question to ask, but they kind of look at stars and they look at the lights of the light of stars and they can work out how big those stars are Then they take photographs of galaxies and they try and do a rough count and then they do a rough count of galaxies and kind of work it out on that. Did you want to add anything, Haiti, to that? No? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there's no short answer to that. Yes, young man. How did Saturn get its rings? How did? Saturn get its rings. Oh, how did Saturn get its rings? Um, there are a number of theories that Saturn's rings are made up of icy particles 
Um, and Saturn's rings are actually being slowly pulled in. Um, AD might want to add something about this as well. But quite often, uh, you know, we've had comets come in and we've had bits of asteroid that have come in and collided with Saturn and left that material around. Some people talk about when Saturn's formed, that's been some of the residue that's been left over as well. You need the mic. You need the mic. Sorry, uh, just wondering if there's any uh, indigenous record keeping of phenomena such as uh, solar eclipses. Hmm. The um, solar eclipses were generally uh, there's 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 a couple that I can't really say with kids around in the audience, but often it's seen when the moon man and the um, the the sun woman meet together. Uh, so I'll say no more other than that. But that's, but that's basically, yeah, uh, when they're recording solar eclipses. But solar eclipses were also seen, you know, as a bit of an omen, as were lunar eclipses. Lunar eclipses, as you know, the, the moon can turn a kind of a blood red. So that was a very scary thing for a lot of groups. And I can understand that. I remember seeing Comet Hokitaki, uh, whenever that came a number of years ago, and it really stood out. And it was like, wow, if you didn't know what this was, it'd be, you'd be scared. You'd be worried what it was. Okay. Ah, we have a question from our special guest. So you talked a little bit about the Magellanic Clouds. Correct. Okay, as two galaxies. Mm -hmm. uh, when will they collide with our Milky Way? Now, I've read that. I can't remember. Um, <laughs> but it's a long while. They're actually already connected um, by the Magellanic Stream, but I don't know what the dates are on uh, collision and so on. Uh, the same, the sa yeah, it's yeah, it's it's in the billion. Uh, it's a long while. Um, as I was saying earlier, um, I was chatting to uh, a group one night, and uh, I was talking about the ages of stars. And a star like Betelgeuse will go for about twelve million years. Our sun is about five thousand million years old, five billion. Um, and I said it's got about another five billion years in it. And a lady in the audience said, "Did you say five billion?" And I said, yes. And she said, oh, thank goodness. I thought you said five million. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I think that's all the questions. So join me thanking Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.